GM, GM. Welcome to Web3 Academy, a place for entrepreneurs, businesses, and creators to explore and learn how to use Web3 to transform your business and build thriving communities. This is Jay Bird, and I'm here to keep you on the forefront of technology so that you don't fall behind. On today's Doer Spotlight, we're talking with Michael Sanders. We're going to be breaking down the three must-haves for Web3 to fully realize its potential. What are they? Number one, we need to create great content that breaks through to a mass audience so that we can onboard a billion people in the next decade, or as Michael thinks, the whole world in the next decade. Number two, we need to make it way easier for developers Building Web3 games and building Web3 apps is hard, it's slow, and it's complex. We're going to talk about how we solve that. And number three, we must improve the user experience and remove the friction of wallets and onboarding to Web3. And we're going to break down how Michael and the Horizon team is doing that. Also on the show, a few other quick points of things that I really enjoyed our discussion around. We talked about how ownership of in-game items makes gaming way better, huge unlock. And we also talked about semi-fungible tokens. Have you heard about semi-fungible tokens? What are they? And why Michael thinks that semi-fungible tokens are going to be bigger than non-fungible tokens. And we're also at the end, stick around to hear what is the one SFT that Michael will never sell? So today on the show to discuss and break this all down for you is Michael Sanders. Michael is the co-founder and chief storyteller at Horizon. Horizon is the creators of the Web3 trading game Skyweaver, which I believe is the best blockchain game there is currently. If you haven't played it, you're going to want to. Horizon also are the creators of Sequence, which is the all-in-one developer platform that makes web building apps and Web3 games easy and simple. And they're also the creators of Nifty Swap, which is a semi-fungible token marketplace that makes trading Web3 collectibles instant because there's liquidity and you don't need to deal with the trouble that you deal with of trading NFTs currently. Super stoked for this one. It's going to be a banger. Michael, welcome to the podcast. Great to have you here. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me, Jay. And hey, everyone. Oh, man. So excited. I still I still remember uh, we were chatting about this just before the show. Uh, the first time you told me about crypto and Web3 uh, at a, um, a Lee Burge uh, All Day I Dream concert. Uh, and you were just, you were so early in the space and so excited. And so uh, I, it took me a few years to catch up, but I finally made it. Yeah. I mean, we all dive in at different times, but that was a really special conversation and yeah, very fond memory. Totally. All right. We'll start off. Michael, just tell us, how did you first fall down the Web3 rabbit hole? How did you get into the space? Yeah, I heard about Bitcoin on a CBC News report back in 2010 as this decentralized hacker money. And <laughs> I immediately thought this is the future and I dove in. And, uh, and then in 2014, about a year before Ethereum's launch, I had the pleasure of meeting Vitalik Buterin. And, mm. you know, I'm, I'm still convinced he's an alien from the future here to teach us about technology, economics, and love. And I fell in love with the notion of Web3 back then before Ethereum even launched. And we weren't calling it Web3, of course, but it was about this next generation of the internet with new applications, new experiences, new economies where both mm. the users and the creators shared in the value generated by mm. the ecosystems they participated in. Um, so yeah, since that time, I've been like extremely enthusiastic about crypto and Web3. And um, yeah, and, you know, and then in uh, 2017, I met my co-founder and our CEO at Horizon, Peter Kieltika. And, um, you know, I had spent a lot of time thinking about like, how can we actually usher in crypto and Web3 technologies so that people and entities around the world will actually use and benefit from them. Mm -hmm. But I didn't, I didn't have that many good ideas. And then I met Peter. And to my knowledge, uh, you know, kind of like middle of 2017, first person to have ever conceptualized blockchain video games. And as soon as he said it, I thought, holy shit, this is it. This is how we can welcome the world to Web3 and do it in a really fun and loving way. 
And mm -hmm. uh, so we founded Horizon shortly thereafter. And, you know, here we are. And, okay, so I, I love what you just said. We're going to usher the world into Web3 in a fun and loving way. Okay, so, but let's talk about first, how are we going to do that? But before we talk about how we're going to do that, what are the, you know, you've been in the space for so long, you've built this incredible company. Uh, what are the challenges that you see that are sort of not allowing us to onboard more users, not allowing more people to join in in the fun of this space? Yeah, so like, we believe every person will be a Web3 participant, likely within the decade. But what's currently throttling adoption is mm -hmm. the user experience, the developer experience, and the content shortcomings. Mm -hmm. So to put it simply, one, there's not enough great content that resonates mm -hmm. with mainstream audiences. Mm -hmm. And two, it's because in large part, it's very difficult, it's hard, slow, and complex to build Web3 games and applications. Mm -hmm. And third, even if you do build a great application, you're still left with all of the friction around the wall <laughs> and onboarding experience to Web3. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think you could have uh, put the challenges in a more simple way. Thank you for articulating those so well for us. Uh, okay, so the question on my mind and the question on everyone's mind, I'm sure, is okay, how, how do we solve those three challenges. So what I'd love to do is sort of go through each one of them uh, and break down how you guys are solving it at Horizon, but also just how you think others, builders, uh, players, participants in the space can be part of solving those challenges. So you mentioned the first one, which was, uh, or you maybe didn't mention this first, but the first one I think we should tackle mm -hmm. is the, there's not enough great content that breaks through to the mass audience. Yeah. So how do we solve that? And let me, let me maybe reframe that question. Looking at gaming as possibly a solution to that, what does gaming enable us to do in order to solve that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think gaming will be one of the biggest drivers of Web3 adoption. And okay. And in large part, it's because blockchain affords us so many advantages to both players and to game creators. Mm -hmm. So there, there's different components to this, right? Like, first off, there's ownership of digital items and video game items. This is hugely important because up until now, you know, video gamers, they're spending 50 billion, 100 billion dollars a year on in-game items that they mm -hmm. don't actually own. You know, they can't really, they can't sell them. They can't trade them unless they do it on a gray market, which, you know, it's difficult. There's risk associated with it. Um, but with Web3, you have your items securely registered to this neutral infrastructure, like the Ethereum network and all of the different blockchains that connect to Ethereum. Mm -hmm. um, and so the ownership is decentralized and means that the user, it, it's actually their property, right? And they can play mm -hmm. with it. They can trade it. They can sell it. If the, you know, if they get bored of the game, they can exit the ecosystem and go take their resources elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's, that's really important. Um, Furthermore, it actually enables, you know, something that people in the space call composability, which mm -hmm. is the notion of building on top of a particular item or asset mm -hmm. or function. So for example, like, let's say you have video game items. Well, with composability, you could build out lending services or the opportunity to create guilds around those and communities around those items. And, you know, things that we'll imagine further into the future, but it, it like leaves a lot more um, creative space around mm -hmm. it. And then another thing that it really helps with, uh, with game creators, um, and ultimately benefiting the users too, is that I think we can shift focus from value extraction uh, and more towards um, like symbiosis amongst users and creators. And okay. I'll kind of explain this in the sense that, you know, in traditional gaming, game creators, they have to put out a ton of content regularly, you know, and, and then they sell that content. Uh, in order to you know keep the game up and running and to keep the community engaged, and I, I think there's still there's still place for that. Like Web three video games, they're definitely going to need to put out content and they'll need to do it at a regular cadence. But I think some of the pressure of needing to monetize it so frequently 
uh, will be alleviated by the fact that it, it, it might be better to actually encourage like really healthy economies and game designs where players are transacting and trading a lot amongst one another. And, and then the game creator could actually monetize transactions and activity occurring in the marketplace or in, in the game ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, so this way you're actually, as a game creator and builder, you're actually optimizing for velocity of activity rather mm -hmm. than just extracting value by selling something uh, in mm -hmm. a moment. And, and I think there will be like hybrids and, you know, different ways of orchestrating this, but it provides like a new landscape in terms of how to think about monetization. Um, and then another thing, right, that kind of ties into the ownership of um, game items is that I think players will feel a greater sense of ownership over the game, the community, and the success of that ecosystem hmm. more so than they would by not getting to own the digital items. It's it's like you're 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 a part owner of the whole ecosystem in some sense, so you want to see it thrive. And I think right. it creates like greater forms of evangelism and ambassadorship and just mm -hmm. community amongst and community. Um, so I think those are a few things, and like there's you know there's a lot more, but I'll kind of yeah pause there. Right, and so. All of that is unlocked by Web3 and blockchain enabling the ownership of in-game items. And you said before, so there's 50 to 100 billion spent on in-game items currently. Yeah, per year. Wow. And yeah. so what is, who who's participating in building these solutions right now? And what is the current... <laughs> What is what is the current gaming uh, offerings look like? Because I think one thing that a lot of us are seeing is, um, in order for a game to thrive, it needs to be fun, right? And uh, a lot of the current blockchain and Web three games, not that they're not fun, but they're they're basic, and, and that's okay because it takes a long time to build a game, and we're still very early. But you know, maybe just frame for us like what's out there right now in terms of the games uh, and what do you see as coming down maybe over the next like several, six months or something like that? Yeah. So yeah, just, just like you said, Jay, like all of the kind of enabling technological solutions and advantages around spending and symbiosis and economies, like none of that matters unless there's a really engaging and fun or strategic mm -hmm experience of a game for players to enjoy none of that other stuff matters so right you know like what we've focused on is right from the beginning of, our, of horizon at the end of 2017 we we focused on building something that anyone could enjoy independent of their web3 knowledge and making a very fun and strategic game first and foremost and mm -hmm. so we built skyweaver which is this trading card game you know some of our team have worked on magic the gathering the you know most mm -hmm. famous perhaps trading card game of all time, maybe besides yep. Pokemon. Um, we have people who have worked at big gaming companies like Ubisoft and Wargaming and, and elsewhere who really come with the, the knowledge uh, and experience of building fun and great games uh, mm -hmm. that don't necessarily have any Web3 experience, right? Because we knew that the content, first and foremost, is what's most important. Right. Um, and, and so for us, it's about building a great game that happens to be you know, powered by Web3 and has all of these Web3 superpowers and economic incentives, et cetera, um, but not relying on that, those incentives and, and those technologies to sell, right. them, for example. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, Skyweaver is like a really good example of one of these pieces of breakthrough content. And we haven't hit our like full inflection point yet. You know, we have hundreds of thousands of players, but we're, I'm, we're still anticipating that it's going to like really pop, you know, and, mm -hmm. um, and we're working towards that and making the game even more engaging. Um, and then there are, I think we're now starting to see and have been seeing a lot of uh, incumbents from the web two gaming space. And whether we're talking mm -hmm. about some of like the really big AAA studios, like who everyone knows mm -hmm. the names of, like they're looking at web three, of course. And then we also have builders from within those companies who are, you know, leaving to start their own web three gaming companies because mm -hmm. they've, they've seen the opportunity and they've, they've seen how it can better serve players and creators. Um, and, and then, so it's ranging from like indie startups of super small teams um, some are web three native and a lot are coming from web two and don't aren't web three native. Um, so I think the content that we're going to see like 
exploding in the next few years is, is going to be amazing because there's so mm. many people who, have, who are now building towards this and take a little bit of time because as you mentioned, it, it requires a lot of dedication and, and energy to create a, a game that's worth playing. Yeah, for sure. One of the other things that uh, always comes up when I think about gaming, or when I'm talking to somebody about game, Web3 Gaming, is people always say that we're going to be able to take goods across from one game to another. And I, I just help me wrap my head around this because I, I, I'm not, like, is that actually possible? Like, I've, I've heard people say, oh, yeah, you're going to be able to take your, you know, you buy a sword in one game and you're going to be able to take it to another game. And like, is that, is that, is that going to happen? If it is going to happen, like, how will that happen? Or is that just a, a misinterpretation of the way Web3 is being used? Yeah, I think in theory, it's cool, though, in practice, it'll be very hard to achieve. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are, I think it's perhaps more easily achievable in certain ecosystems. Like imagine you're a big game publisher, you have tons of different games, maybe you can figure out a way to have an item that interoperates amongst all the games. But even still then, you know, you, you have different like game directors for each game that aren't necessarily mm -hmm. thinking about like the interoperability with this other game. Like they're just trying to right. make a good game first and foremost. So where, so I think it actually makes less sense with game items that impact, let's say strategy or the economy in a game, mm -hmm. because it's just so hard to, it's hard enough to balance a game item in one game, let alone like mm -hmm. games or something. Where I think it, it we'll see it appear first is more in metaverse experiences, um, more mm. social utility items such as like digital fashion or what your avatar is wearing um, and, and navigating a metaverse realm. I think that makes more sense to have what, you know, those types of things interoperate in different experiences. And even still though, you know, there's, there's challenges there with respect to how do those items or that fashion manifest in different virtual worlds in different metaverse environments or different gaming environments because mm -hmm. the graphics in uh, roblox are different than the graphics in nifty island or you know so mm -hmm. but you could still have that same item and it could just appear differently but yeah there's still um so that's where i think the interoperability and bringing items from one world to another make a little more sense to me at this time and you know, i'm sure there are many other ideas out there as right. well Right. Yeah. One thing that uh, I'm reading Matthew Ball's uh, metaverse book right now. And one thing that actually really helped me was his chapter about defining the metaverse, because it's so it's so nascent and so difficult to understand really what it is. And one thing he explained really well, and I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts on this, uh, was this idea that what we are currently talking about as the metaverse is actually a virtual world. And so a game would be more like a virtual world. And then we'll have meta galaxies, which would be a like R Roblox would be possibly an example of meta galaxy, or maybe even it's actually bigger than Roblox. It's something where they're all using the same standards and they all interact. And then we'll have metaverses, which is like the internet today and just like everybody's on it and connecting. Does that, does that definition breakdown make sense to you? How do you think about it? Yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense. And I think Matthew Ball is definitely a visionary, especially with respect to storytelling and articulating mm -hmm. what these things can be. Um, so, you know, especially when the words first started becoming popular, you know, because it's mm -hmm. obviously coined back in the 80s, but um, when it started becoming popular kind of during the pandemic, you know, that's mm -hmm. when everyone started talking about the metaverse, is like at first I thought there should only be one metaverse, not metaverses. Um, mm -hmm. I guess you can make the same argument about universes though. So yeah, anyway, it could be a multi-metaverse. Um, <laughs> so, but the way I imagine the, let's say we just use the metaverse as an example. And I think, yeah, the thing should interoperate, interoperate within the metaverse. So you can actually bring goods to different places within. Whereas if you're in a contained environment that you can't interoperate with, that is a virtual world. So it's like, exactly, like video games like Skyweaver would be one virtual world amongst mm -hmm. a much larger set of other virtual worlds. I also think something like Roblox is a virtual world, but it just happens to be a much bigger virtual world. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe mm -hmm. the Meta Galaxy is a good way to, or, a, or I don't know, something galaxy is a good way to mm -hmm. describe that. But then like kind of the overarching architecture that standardizes all of it and allows everything to interoperate, 
kind of like the HTTP protocol, which, you know, you mentioned of the internet or like Web3, mm -hmm. like the Ethereum or EVM protocol being the underlying base layer as what kind of enables the entire metaverse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's, I want to, I want to lead, you bring up protocols and I want to lead us into the next problem that you brought up at the beginning of the episode. So, uh, and that problem was building Web3 games and apps is hard, slow, and complex. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the reasons is because of the lack of standardization and the lack of protocols. Uh, but I won't, you lead us in. Why is this a problem and how can we solve it? Yeah, I think it's most difficult to build Web3 applications and games because it it's still a very nascent space. So mm -hmm. you know, the protocols are new and they're hard to work with. Um, mm -hmm. You know, whether we're talking about Ethereum or Polygon or Binance Smart Chain or Avalanche or Optimism or Arbitrum, um, they're all like, it is, especially for someone new to the space, like they're, they're difficult to engage with. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And, and so that makes building an application hard because you have to, like, not only do you need to achieve this great piece of content, you need to right. solve all this underlying infrastructure, um, <laughs> right? <laughs> which, which like, that's a whole business, yes. whole it's solution, a, whole endeavor right. of itself. Um, and we actually had to do that, you know, and we knew we would have to do that when we set out to build the company. We were like, okay, to actually create Skyweaver and to create a seamless experience for users, we're going to have to solve a lot of the infrastructure problems. And mm -hmm. fortunately for us, like, you know, half of our founding team's core competency is in architecture and open systems and open standards and open source technology and developer tools. So when we started building Skyweaver, we were solving all of our own pain points along the way mm -hmm. and ultimately productizing each of the solutions we developed. And now it's become what we call sequence, which is this all-in-one developer platform. It's a stack of tools, uh, including like a smart wallet and different token and NFT mm. and SFT APIs and like on-ramps and transaction services and marketplace tools and like node and data services and, you know, SDKs, whether you're building with a Unity engine or an Unreal engine or on mobile. Mm -hmm. And so we put all of these things together under the sequence uh, brand as like this all-in-one place where you can come to start building your Web3 game or application. Right, right. Um, amazing that you guys have done that. It's incredible. And I think you nailed it when you said it's it's a big challenge when you are a startup and a small business and you you don't have infrastructure. So what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to also build the infrastructure at the same time. So I know one big way that you guys have really contributed to the space, and we mentioned semi-fungible tokens earlier, is by co-authoring ERC-1155. Uh, so I think first question, maybe you can explain what is ERC-1155, but I'd also love to talk about how you guys went about co-authoring a standard and mm -hmm. what that looks like and the the need for more focus on building these standards because i think that's a, it's something that's so um uh, so so soft and so difficult to wrap our head around you know we all went to we understand business maybe but we don't necessarily understand like developing protocols and developing standards unless we're from the you know, super talented mega star horizon team of architects. <laughs> yeah, none of those standards were developed by me. I'll have to definitely acknowledge that. It's, um, yeah, we have absolute geniuses on our team, like from high up to working like deep down and like low level stuff. Um, and it was actually uh, Philippe Castongue, our director of product, who co authored the ERC 1155. Uh, multi-token standard, aka semi-fungible token standard. And what it is, I think I'll I'll start by kind of making some comparisons and just laying some like groundwork definitions okay. in that I'll, I imagine most people listening to this podcast or maybe not all, but have heard of like ERC-20 standard. This is for fungible tokens, the famous cryptocurrencies like Ether and Matic and USDC. Mm -hmm. um, these are all ERC-20 tokens. Each one is fungible with the other, which means that, you know, they're equivalent. 
Uh, and then we have the ERC721 standard, the NFT non-fungible token standard. And the, the NFT standard was kind of just emerging as we were building Skyweaver and thinking mm -hmm. about the future of games. Um, and it's excellent for unique one-of-one -one items, you know, particular artworks, uh, real estate, um, anything that there should only be one copy of. Mm -hmm. However, for video game items, most video game items, this doesn't make sense because like if you think of a trading card game, for example, um, and for anyone who's not familiar, think of like Pokemon, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's each card, uh, you know, you could have the Charizard card or the Pikachu card, right? Or like mm -hmm. in Skyweaver, I'll use the Pandora card as an example. Mm -hmm. Each silver Pandora card needs to be fungible, needs to be interchangeable with any other silver Pandora card mm -hmm. because they're equivalent. And, but then the Pandora card is not fungible with the fungi card. They're not mm -hmm. equivalent. You can't trade them one for one. And so this is why we needed to create the ERC 1155 SFT standard. I'll, I'll just, I'll call them SFTs moving forward. So semi-fungible okay. tokens, SFT. Yep. And what, what these enable is um, the much healthier markets and liquidity for different items. And this applies to games or metaverse experiences or you know, a lot of different projects. Like it, it has wide ranging applications, but so it enables healthier markets, liquidity for those markets and price discovery. So really making them perfect for video game items. Cause you can imagine like if you're playing a game and like, I don't know, you need particular tools like maybe you need like shovels or maybe you need weapons or mm -hmm. you know you need cards. There needs to be liquidity for those to enable trading. And if each one is a one of one, you don't know how to price something. You don't know its value. And then you could have all of these similar items being posted up for sale. And you're like, why are they all at different prices? I don't know which one to mm -hmm. buy. So SFTs enable so that you can actually have like standardization and pricing. And then you can, it's, it's easier to know the value of something. Um, and, and so, yeah, SFTs are really powerful for gaming and we took it a step further. We actually, uh, created something called the nifty swap protocol, mm -hmm. which for anyone listening is like Uniswap for SFTs. So Uniswap for web three mm -hmm. video game items and metaverse goods and really much any web three collectible. Um, so what it does is it allows, um, the, so we built the protocol, it actually powers something called the Skyweaver market, and we're soon releasing niftyswap.io, which is okay. a general marketplace for all different Web3 collectibles, all different SFTs. Mm -hmm. And so what it allows the user to do is instantly buy or sell these game items. Uh, and this is a big difference. Like if you look at, um, something like OpenSea. OpenSea mm -hmm. is you know, the premier destination for NFTs and will continue to be so, I believe, like we're not we're not competing with them because mm -hmm. uh, they're focused on ERC 721s. And mm -hmm. you know, put up bid orders, they, you know, when you when you're trying to sell something, you place a you press a price and there's like this acceptance and time process. Mm -hmm. Um but with SFTs and what we built in Nifty Swap, it's it's instant. You just like mm -hmm. see the price that you can sell it for, you press the button and boom, you've sold it, you get your USDC. Or, you know, you want to buy something, you see the price, you can do it. It's instantaneous and it's all done in a decentralized manner. Um, so, yeah, that, that's in part why like SFTs are really, really important for moving forward and makes it a lot easier for game creators because it's just, it's a much more uh, versatile and applicable and actually efficient standard um, mm -hmm. for these applications. So what is... This is fascinating. Semi-fungible tokens, so interesting. And I instantly understand the use case for it in terms of games. I have two questions and we can take them one at a time. Is One is, uh, who else is making SFTs right now? Is it only games or is there any other use cases for it outside of games? And also, is is do you see, how do you see this sort of long-term? Is this going to be the case where um, I, as a user, as a player, uh, you know, buy something, uh, will I be buying and selling these things in the game? Will each game have their own marketplace or will it be the case where I'll take it to a nifty swap or to an outside marketplace? Uh, so tackle those questions one at a time. Yeah. So 
Uh, first question, a bunch of different, mostly games are okay. you, the ERC-1155 standard. Like we actually co-authored it with the Sandbox um, years ago. So mm -hmm. the Sandbox has some uh, SFTs in their game. Um, cool Cats is also using SFTs. Mm -hmm. um, they also have an NFT component as well, just so right. you know, know both exist. Um, Parallel is a game that has SFTs. Alluvium is a game that has SFTs. Sunflower Land is a game that has SFTs. And, um, you know, more and more coming out. I think another space where SFTs make a ton of sense is digital fashion. Mm. So, like, you know, if you have a t shirt or something in the metaverse, like, there could be a thousand copies of it. You can create limited editions, et cetera, mm -hmm. right? You could in theory have an NFT too, right? But it's just it's just different, right? A one of one piece of clothing is different than one that there's like a million copies of. Mm -hmm. uh, and then like, so like when I think of SFTs, like video games, digital fashion, and then whatever is coming in the metaverse, like, because the way I imagine it is that we will, there will be many aspects of the physical world that end up translating into the metaverse. And then there will be tons of differences, I'm sure. But mm -hmm. It could be that, like, I don't know, we might have furniture in the metaverse, you know, um, and, and that furniture, like, it makes sense to be SFTs, we might have car, like, well, we will have cars in the metaverse, or some other, like, transportation devices, or teleporters, you know, and those could be SFTs. Um, anything where there's multiple copies of an item, mm -hmm. it makes mm -hmm. sense as an SFT. Um, you know, there's also a component where you can kind of build in, the, build in the royalty payments. I mean, I think that can exist for NFTs as well. But um, uh, yeah, so that's like, like, I don't even really, I don't really know how to like fully think about all the potential <laughs> for building it. I just think there are tons and tons. Yeah. And I, yeah, I do think the SFT standard will be even bigger than the NFT standard. Um, and, and then where people trade these. So great question. Um, it's interesting because like as a company, we actually, we have the Skyweaver market directly inside Skyweaver, which is powered by the Nifty Swap protocol that we built mm -hmm. because we wanted to have a, a marketplace in game that's super easy for the players to go to. And it's very intuitive. And all the Skyweaver market displays are Skyweaver game items, right? Mm -hmm. Like trading cards and crystals and other items. There, there are no items from the sandbox in the Skyweaver market. And mm -hmm. that's intentional. Um, also, if you have a marketplace in your own game, as a creator, you can monetize, uh, tr you can take transaction fees, right? Mm -hmm. And like, so you're, you're capitalizing on the velocity and providing your users like a super seamless experience. Um, that said, there are many games that don't necessarily want to build their own marketplace. And it's for a variety of reasons. Like sometimes it's a resource constraint, um, mm -hmm. sometimes, or they're just trying to get to market faster. Or, you know, as Nifty Swap grows in popularity, and we're even seeing it now prior to us officially having launched it, like we'll launch it this fall, um, but we have some folks testing it. Um, they, they even just want to like build it for convenience and because they think it could be a better user experience because they're like, oh, if people just know like trade game items on Nifty Swap, just like, yeah, just go there and do it. Um, you know, kind of like, it's a bit different, but like, well, people go to Steam because they know video games are there, or mm -hmm, people mm -hmm. go to OpenSea because they know NFTs are there. It's like, oh, just go to Nifty Swap because there are game items there. That said, I'm sure many games will still want to build their own uh, marketplace in game. And like what we've created with Sequence, you know, as part of the Sequence offering, there's the Nifty Swap protocol in it, and we're building an SDK as well. So it'll be easy for you to um, create your own marketplace. Or because everything is interoperable and like standardized in the Web3 and Ethereum ecosystem, someone can use the whole sequence stack and then they could also decide to leverage Seaport, which is like a marketplace protocol that OpenSea has created, which is different, but like, you know, you, so you could build different kinds of marketplaces because maybe you don't want the nifty swap one, right? There's like different, different use cases will mm -hmm. call for different solutions. Yeah. What are we going to call? Uh, I'm just so curious because, you know, you're, uh, as the chief storyteller at Horizon, and you're so good with words and framing things, uh, one thing that always comes up for me is the challenge of language, right? And, you know, if you want to enter Web3 right now, like, you've basically, you've got to take a, you got to carry a dictionary around with you, mm -hmm. right? You know, in <laughs> terms of both, in terms of the the actual, um, like, protocol language and the, what I'll say, I'm trying to think like the more dictionary stuff. And then also you need like a slang dictionary just to understand like GM and friend and uh, like, so 
Okay. What are, I'm just curious if you have a, a stance on what are we going to call, are we going to call SFTs semi SFTs and are we going to call NFTs NFTs? Uh, or like, I know meta, you know, they've, they've been pulling in um, the ability to, I think it was just about a month ago when they, now you can post NFTs on Facebook and on Instagram, but they don't call them NFTs. They call them digital collectibles. Just curious if you have a, a, a word that you guys are throwing around and is it going to be the same word for SFTs and NFTs? Or are we going to have to have different language? Yeah. I'll be honest with you, man. It's been, it's been a journey. Like since we started the company, like we weren't thrilled about the term NFT. We we're like, I mean, no one's okay. going to call it like NFT or like non-fungible token. Like what well, we knew no one was going to say non-fungible token. Right. And like right. some of us, we kind of thought nifties was a cool word, like mm -hmm. nifty. And there's a bit of groundswell about that years mm -hmm. ago. Um, but then it was just the term NFT blew up, you know, <laughs> like it was like, okay. And like, we knew that Skyweaver cards weren't technically NFTs. They weren't technically non-fungible tokens, yeah. but we started doing surveys on Twitter. Like, does it, does something have to be a one-of-one -one item to be called an NFT? And like the overwhelming right. response was no, like as long as it's a right. collectible, it's an NFT. And we're like, okay, well, okay. So everyone just has this like cultural understanding. It's like the lexicon, right? That yeah. it's an NFT. So we, we refer to Skyweaver cards as NFT is just because like, you know, to, to uh, lower the kind of education requirement. If someone kind mm -hmm. of already gets it, like, you can, you can leverage that term. And so now we're, we're pushing the SFTs because, um, well, in one part, you know, a lot of people aren't excited about NFTs, you know, mm -hmm. like in the for sure. gaming world, for example, like they think it's kind of crap. Mm -hmm. um, so even just like repositioning in a bit saying like, Hey, like, yeah, you don't like this, but like, these are different. Um, so at least like consider it, maybe you can come at it from a different angle. I don't know if that'll be enough to solve it. Right. But I do think that we're going to push this narrative forward. Um, others are, they're kind of tuning into it. There's a bit of groundswell around it. So mm -hmm. it, it feels very much at like the dawning of a new age, like that SFTs could be like NFT 2.0, not in the sense of like replacing NFTs, but in creating mm -hmm. this next wave of momentum around the web three ecosystem. And I don't know, maybe we'll land on like even kind of better terms than a three mm -hmm. letter acronym, but you know, it, it's hard to predict because we, we've decided we're going to push SFTs. So, okay. you know, that being said, if we learn, if there's new insight, right, like we'll, we'll, we'll For adapt. Sure. And if we see a better opportunity, we'll adapt. Uh, but I, I think that's the, that's the path forward for now. And yes, I think there will be NFTs and then there will be SFTs. Oh boy. So keep your, keep your Web3 dictionary handy because there's just more and more lingo coming at you. Uh, okay. Although, Jay, I will say I really do like Web3 collectibles or like tradable goods or that, that stuff's pretty intuitive. So yeah, yeah I think those things yeah. work. I feel like, I feel like we're going to land there long-term. I don't know. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I mean, we're certainly not going to say ERC 721, ERC 1155, <laughs> like, you know, there's just no way uh, we're not all, you know, Elon Musk's of the world who have a brain to handle that. Uh, I'm certainly not. Uh, okay. I just want to touch quickly before we move on from this point, a little bit more on building interoperable standards and protocols. Um, do you have any, an, any advice, uh, for, um, and I know you're not necessarily the architect on your team, so maybe, maybe this isn't necessarily, you're the right person to ask, but, uh, if, if we have listeners out there who want to participate in building interoperable standards or want to build protocols, uh, how can they get involved with that? Or actually what we probably have more of is we probably have listeners who just want to learn about the standards and want to understand them. Um, how, how would you recommend going about that? Yeah, I mean, we're so if you go to sequence.xyz, uh, we're going to be updating the site soon to be even more developer focused. Okay. Um, but increasingly over time, there will be content and also like documentation about how mm. to build with our tools and explanations in there as well as to like what they mean. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a good place. Um, and then, I mean, if you go to ethereum.org, you can find a lot of kind of I was going to say lower level stuff, but there's a mix. Like you can, you can learn a lot by just navigating around there about like different protocols. And I would say a, a great idea would be to join the sequence discord because there's just like mm. conversation in there that can be mm -hmm. a little more organic and more, you know, multi-directional than just like consuming content. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but yeah, you know, other than that, like Twitter, there's lots of people talking about it. Mm-hmm. YouTube, mm-hmm. Fine. I feel like the, the challenge that I see is that um, there's no clear way to monetize building a standard or building a protocol, right? It's harder to, and, you know, we're sort of stuck and this brings up this bigger question around, you know, web three versus web two is, you know, we still, we do live in a world where, you know, we need to create value and develop income and build businesses. Right. And so the, the balance of, and, and maybe I'm wrong. Like I, I look at POAP, for example, I'm fascinated by POAP. Like there's a, there's a protocol that I think most people have used uh, it's you know proof of attendance protocol if you haven't heard of it uh, and it's it's simple but like I don't know if you know like is POAP a business like I look at them and I'm like I can't figure out the business model so I think that's kind of where I think a lot of people get stuck is it's it's easier to go to where the money flows right and so um, you know I don't know maybe we need I'm not sure what the what the answer is or what the solution is and I'm just sort of talking out loud right now but it's uh, yeah it's it's I think it's a tough one. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's, you know, that's why we built products, right? Like mm-hmm. we productized our solutions because mm-hmm. you, know, you need to monetize as well. And um, for example, the ERC 1155, right? Like we don't make money from that, but it's a standard we've, it's like a public good as Vitalik mm-hmm. talks about, right? It's right. Like something you contribute to the ecosystem so that others can leverage and build from it. Um, so I think it's just about like, understanding why you're building something and like mm-hmm. is it public good is it to serve the ecosystem and, and or is it a product that can also serve the ecosystem but has a clear monetization model in it you know mm-hmm. and if you're going to pour all your love and energy into building something i think it's very good to be clear about what your intention with it is and like mm-hmm. do you need to make money from it mm-hmm. you, you, you got to think about that fairly early on um yeah and, th- and that's a great you know Labeling as a public good is a great way to label it because once you, once you put it under that category, uh, it does change the way you view it. And there's other ways to fund public goods, right? Like that makes me think about Gitcoin grants as an option to fund a public good. So yeah, great point there. Okay, let's move on to the the third problem that you mentioned at the beginning of the episode, uh, which I'll, I'll remind our listeners because it's been, it's been a little bit, but uh, that was the friction of wallets and onboarding, the user experience. I mean, this is a big one that I think we all, we all struggle with and we all wonder when it's going to get better. Uh, talk to us about that problem and how you guys are solving that. Yeah, so we've solved it with the sequence wallet. Uh, the sequence wallet is part of the whole like sequence developer platform. The kind of key distinguisher uh, with sequence compared to the other products in the platform is that the sequence wallet is the only one that the end user is going to know that they're interfacing with, right? Like the mm-hmm. end user will have a sequence wallet. They're not going to care about like a node gateway, for example. Mm-hmm. But um, <laughs> yeah. so the the sequence wallet it what it does is it really makes web3 easy fun and secure for everyone okay. like you don't need to know anything about web3 to use this or nothing about crypto like you just go in two clicks you can create this secure non-custodial multi-chain multi-sig multi-key smart contract wallet and i know that's a lot of words <laughs> that like a lot of people won't understand but basically what it's doing is it's granting you this seamless and secure access to the world of web3 and so you you mentioned smart contract wallets uh and i i believe that you guys also developed another standard here uh around smart contract wallets can you tell us a little bit about that standard and more so probably what's what is a smart contract wallet and what does it enable yeah so again as our director of product philippe he he co-authored erc 1271 shout out philippe I, yeah yeah Way to go. I, what a guy I these things um but shout out to many people on our team too like peter our ceo and just talk, everyone across the board like true geniuses and visionaries mm-hmm. and um they um yeah so Philippe created, co-authored ERC-1271 standard to enable smart contract wallets um, across the ecosystem. And a smart contract wallet, um, I'll I'll use a comparison. So most people in Web3 are probably familiar with what's called an externally owned account or short form EOA. 
probably don't know the term, but this is what this is what it's technically called. And it means that the wallet is governed by a single private key. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you've used it, some of the popular wallets out there, you know that there's a single private key. Um, so would MetaMask be an example yeah, of that? Okay. Exactly. So, and, and you know, there's, there's advantages to this, but if you ever lose that private key or someone steals it, Mm -hmm. everything's gone and you know we all know that the user experience about the wallet you just mentioned is not not that great and it's not <laughs> going to be what onboards like the next billions of people to web3 right um and that's not a discredit to them because i give tremendous kudos to the metamask team like they've helped really bootstrap and yeah get a lot of things going um but now we're like we're ready to enter this new era you know so with sequence being governed by multiple private keys it, it enables user friendliness and better security. So as an example, it means that one of the keys can be tied to a social login. So now this means like if you go to sequence.app, mm -hmm. you can create your wallet in two clicks. Like you can log in with Google or Facebook or um, Instagram or like whatever social application you want. Um, and then boom, in two clicks, you have this secure wallet. Um, we're also enabling the, the ability mm -hmm. if you want to extract a single private key, like you can do that, but like 99 point whatever percent of users mm. aren't, aren't going to want that or care for it. It also means that like, um, let's say you lose your cell phone in, a, in an Uber and mm -hmm. you don't, you don't get it back. Right. Like you can go and log in from a different device and kick your device off and then like rotate that key out. So it means that like, it's affording you a greater amount of security. Cause like, you know, if you ever lost your private key to a EOA wallet in an Uber, well, good luck. It's gone right? forever. It's gone. I mean, <laughs> By the same token, the, the driver of the car would have to know what it was for it to be useful. But, uh, right. you know, um, so, yeah, it's like, like, if you go play Skyweaver, like a lot of our players, they don't, they don't know they're really creating, they don't know they're creating a Web3 wallet. Like it's just, huh. this is creating a game account, but boom, you have this wallet. And what's really important is that it's non-custodial. Um, so, you know, like there's custodial wallets, which means that it's essentially like a traditional bank account in that whatever you put in it, whether it's NFTs or SFTs or ETH or USDC or crypto, um, you're actually relinquishing ownership of it over to the custodian. Mm -hmm. um, they have full control of it. This is why people always advise, like, don't leave your tokens on an exchange, a centralized exchange. Mm -hmm. um, and similarly, there, there are games that do this. They have custodial wallet solutions, which... I personally think is short-sighted. Um, I, I think it will matter a lot. Um, things will happen. You know, someone gets hacked and then boom, like yeah. everything's gone. Um, and then and then you're faced with this notion of like, oh, well, do we just, do? does the game creator replace everyone's items that were stolen? But then like now you could, you're doubling everything up and then the thief still has everything. So now you have duplicates and it affects the economy. <laughs> Right. Um, so it's, it's not like a quick fix to just say like, oh, insurance covers that because no, now you're affecting the economic supply of things. Mm. Um, whereas a non-custodial wallet means that the user is in custody of their assets. Like sequence, mm -hmm. we, we can't like, we can't touch anything you have. Like we don't even like it, there's no access to it by any mm -hmm. means. Um, that's the same with MetaMask, but just saying that like we've, we've harmonized like this secure, like non-custodial nature, plus this multi-key architecture, plus this seamless UX so that anyone can use it. Yeah. Which is such a big unlock because I think that right now there's just, the wallet is a big, it's a big hurdle for a lot yeah. of people to get over, right? Like uh, I, I even get confused using my wallet all the time. You know, you get a transact, you know, oh, you need to sign this. I'm like, should I sign this? What is this? You know, I'm looking at it. I'm stressing. I'm sweating. Like it's yeah. it's a rough, it's a rough experience. Okay. So so smart contract wallets like sequence is mm -hmm. so could somebody would it be worth somebody going and using sequence to manage their NFTs and their tokens? Or is it made yeah. specifically for just game items? Oh, no, no, for sure. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Like it, in fact, it has like amazing NFT support, you know, like you can view mm -hmm. your collections like in gallery mode and you can see the artwork or whether it's a video, like you can see all the metadata, you can see the price that it traded at on like a market. So like all just built into the wallet. So not only can like you securely store and trade from your wallet, like you can actually experience your NFTs in your wallet. 
Um, so yeah, it, it's amazing for that. You know, like it has built-in on-ramps into it. So like, if you want to go uh, fiat to crypto, you can do that. Mm -hmm. We're enabling mm -hmm. something called smart ramps shortly with our partner Wire so that you can go directly from credit or debit card to buy an NFT or an SFT. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, that that's really helpful because it actually like increases the success rate of fiat to crypto transactions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, like we even enable developers to enable gasless transactions uh, via sponsoring the transaction so that the users don't have to pay mm -hmm. gas. And that's really good for onboarding new people who might not have like Matic token to interact on the mm -hmm. Polygon network. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's like, it's this multi-chain wallet. So it's compatible with all EVM chains. Um, and for anyone who doesn't know what that term means, it stands for Ethereum virtual machine. So this consists of networks, of course, like Ethereum, Polygon, Binance, Smart Chain, Avalanche, Optimism, Arbitrum, uh, and, and more and more coming online. Like everyone's really striving to be EVM compatible. Um, so yeah, it's like gives you this, there's, there's built-in swap functionalities for token. Uh, there's built-in bridging. So like you can access everything from this same uh, seamless, beautiful UI. And it gives you like, it grants you access to all these different networks, all these different applications. Um, yeah. So it's, it's really powerful. It's incredible. Oh my gosh. Thank you. Shout out to the team again. Let's, uh, this is, this is amazing what you guys are building for the space. And this is exactly what we need more of. Uh, okay. I want to switch over to sort of wrap up, uh, and do a little bit of speed round. Uh, but before I do anything else you want to share before we uh, get into the speed round? Uh, I know we had a whole bunch of things to talk about in the episode, and I think we've gotten through most of them, but there's just so many things to discuss. Anything else you wanted to bring up? I, I think we've talked about it all, man. If anyone wants to know like about more, just go to horizon.io, and then you'll mm -hmm. find links to each of our different products. Yeah, awesome. And we'll include uh, all the links mentioned. Uh, we talked about Sequence, we talked about Nifty Swap, uh, both Sequence Wallet and Sequence, the developer platform. We'll include all those links in the show notes, as well as the Horizon uh, link as well. Uh, while we're on the topic, where can people find you online if they want to reach out to you? Yeah, I'd say Twitter is probably the best. It's just at underscore Michael Sanders. Okay. Awesome. We'll put that in the link to the sh in the show notes as well. Uh, okay, speed round. Uh, everybody's favorite part of the episode. A uh, couple questions coming at you quickly. First, what's an NFT that you'll never sell? Okay, so it's it's actually an SFT. The one uh, of course, of course. Sorry. <laughs> and um, it's it's a Pandora card from the game Skyweaver. Um, I have a few copies of each, like the gold and the silver, uh, but it's actually. Yeah, it's a crazy long story, but the artwork for this card was designed prior to me ever even meeting our chief designer. And when he showed it to me, he was like, oh, this is the first female character in Skyweaver. And I looked at him like, holy shit, like that looks identical to my fiance. And so I sent it to her and she was like, that's me. And I'm like, I know. And um, her name is Pandora. And the mythology of the name Pandora is that uh, Pandora is the first woman ever. Um, and so this was the first female character created in the game Skyweaver and had no name at the time. So I was like, well, we better name, like, can we name the card oh Pandora? And like, everyone's like, yeah, of course. Like, that's crazy because they look so much alike. And her last name is Skies and the game's called Skyweaver. So I was like, so yeah, now that like, that was in the conceptual stage. So now that the Pandora card exists as like an SFT, like I definitely own those and I'm not, not looking to sell them. Like, are you, are you tapped into another dimension, Michael? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, that's unbelievable. And I, I have met Pandora and I can confirm that she does look exactly like the Pandora card. I also have to mention Pandora has one of the best giggles and laughs there is out there. <laughs> Shout out Pandora. If you ever get a chance to meet her in person, or maybe I'll have her on the podcast sometime, just get, I'll get her, I'll get a, a soundbite of her laugh so I can play it. <laughs> 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 okay uh a one or any web3 projects that you're following or that you're excited about currently yeah i mean actually a number of the ones we're working with like on the mm -hmm. sequence front um so cool cats um i think cool cats is really cool like a really mm -hmm. cool nft project that's building out their gaming experience mm -hmm. um there's also uh there's a group called super gaming i'm really excited to see what they're building 
Um, I really like Nifty Island. It's a free land mm-hmm. metaverse and um, it's in an alpha right now. And I just think, yeah, I, I think they have some like really cool ideas and community already. Another mm-hmm. game called Dark Earth, uh, Mecha Chain, and a whole bunch more that like, yeah, who are like big web two players who are coming into web three that I, I don't think I can share too much like publicly about them yet, but they're like mm-hmm. some you know, some of the biggest game creators in the world, mm-hmm. like they're like, we're working with them and talking about bringing their games into web three. So I'm like really excited to see what they create. Cause they're like so incredible at creating games and experiences like, okay, how, mm-hmm. like how awesome is this going to be in the web three ecosystem? Incredible. It's really interesting that you bring up uh, uh, nifty Island as a free land metaverse. Uh, and I think we'll have to maybe do another podcast or something in the future and one of the topics is going to have to be metaverses and should they be selling land or should it be free land because that is a really interesting topic which i also have opinions on cool yeah there's another game uh sunflower land that's really cool um there there are a whole bunch uh time raiders wild card yeah bunch of i'm talking about mostly games i guess just because that's mm-hmm. like most of my attention has been for sure lately and yeah i hear you man like freeland versus paid land like we intentionally made skyweaver free to play um mm-hmm. uh, so that you know it's just more accessible um mm. yeah yeah cool okay something you've bought recently uh or it could be at any point something you've purchased for under 100 dollars that brings you joy yeah i'm this is not not that recent i mean many years ago but gymnastics rings um mm. i think they're they're incredible like movement and fitness and health tool. And you can kind of go anywhere with them. Like you can hang them for a tree or hang them from a bar somewhere. So um, yeah. And they're really fun and they're great. For okay. Strength. Where, where do you usually, where's your go-to Eddie's in your house? Are they at your office? Like what, where's your yeah. go-to gymnastic ring spot? They're, they're in my house. They're hanging in my house now. Um, I have like a, a full gym and like, like squat rack and you know okay. all the way to kettlebells barbells etc and um also like a lot of room to move and dance um that that's essential very important and then the gymnastics rooms we used to have them hung in our horizon office but then the pandemic hit and haven't ha- we haven't had an office since <laughs> but then I, I also really enjoy hanging them outside like in a forest or in a park that's mm. like that's a really nice experience cool cool i love that uh okay final question if you had a billboard that 1 billion people were going to see, what would you write on that billboard? Love and play. Love and play. It's, I was going to say I love it, but (laughs) (laughs) it's it's, powerful words, incredible simplicity. And I did, you know, I did notice your email sign off is is love which is really you must be the only person i've ever emailed with that uses that as a sign off i feel like that word is reserved so much for for family and for 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 loved ones it's not necessarily used so much i don't know maybe there's an uncomfortable com- uncomfortable part about it but it's not used enough uh i think in the day-to-day language but it's so powerful yeah yeah i feel like I've always perceived that signing off emails with love is just like an opportunity to insert a bit more of that or to acknowledge Mm -hmm. that it exists, Mm -hmm. you know, and like I've had a lot of people comment on it too, you know, they reflect. And I think, you know, too, like sometimes you're talking about a serious issue or like a business issue and like signing off there, like knowing like, Hey, like it's, it's all love, you know, like we're just, we're trying to work towards things together. Mm -hmm. Um, I, you know, like, love is also one of our company's values. It's one of my life's guiding values. And I, I believe it's the fabric of existence. So I just want to like, as a send off, just being like, just like, remember that, you know? Beautiful. Couldn't be any better way to end an episode. I I feel like I often tell our, our listeners, I love them. Maybe I don't say it enough, but it's, it's, it is a, uh, it's an important, important word to use and uh, you can't use it enough. So Michael, I love you. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's just been a wonderful time. I love you too, brother. And thank you to everyone listening. I love you all as well. Fantastic. Have a great day. Have a great week, everybody. And uh, look forward to catching you next time on the show. Cheers. Cheers.
Thank you for listening to Web3 Academy. We hope this helps you along your Web3 journey. And if it does, please share this episode and subscribe so you don't miss the next one. Nothing in this podcast was financial advice. Crypto and Web3 can be risky. You can literally lose it all. In fact, if you invest on account of what we say, you probably will lose it all. So don't do that. In all honesty, the point of this podcast is to remove the noise of markets and price and focus on utility and implementation anyway. So you should not take any of this as financial advice. Thank you, friends, and see you in the next one.